Great. Um, so yeah, great. So as Erin said, my name is Floor, and today I will be talking to you about um, some research related to barriers to participating in the gig economy. And so it's quite exciting that um, Hernan talked about this last study about hiring biases in uh, on on gig platforms, and and this will this will give us some more insights on um, on the participation side of things. So who who are the uh, the people who are in the space and who are not? And so to set the stage here, um, I will start with the assumption that the internet prevents uh, presents a range of valuable opportunities. And so we might be thinking here about things like community building, collaboration, connection. I think that's something we can agree on that the internet does indeed um, present us with a bunch of opportunities. And so the line of research that uh, we've been talking about, uh, which is often described as digital inequality, um, questions, are these opportunities available to everyone? And today I'll be talking about that question in the context of the gig economy. Uh, but really this, um, this research, we can distill lessons from it uh, about online participation more generally. And so the gig economy has been um, defined in all kinds of ways. Um, the way that I think about it is as platforms that function as online marketplaces. Uh, so they're connecting individuals uh, who are selling services uh, and individuals or companies looking to purchase those uh, services. And that all happens on a piece or project-based, uh, uh, through piece or project-based contracts. Um, and so these gig platforms mediate opportunities that can have a very particular clear payoff that uh, is uh, a form of income. And so questions around access and participations are, particularly non-trivial in this context. Um, so I'm going to discuss uh, a couple of studies here, and all of them are focused on different uh, slices and segments of the gig economy. And I'll try to, I'll try to signal that. Um, so really that question of like, um, who is able to actually reap the benefits or, or um, have access to these opportunities online is a question of who, who participates. So a way of thinking about this is who participates, who is there and who is not there. And so in the, in the next two studies that I will talk about, what we've done is um, surveyed samples of um, US adults. Um, which obviously includes both people who've done this work and people who've not done this work, and then compare these two groups in terms of their background characteristics and their internet skills. Um, and so this first study is in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, this, again, aligns quite nicely with uh, the uh, introduction that Hernan gave about this, um, which is that um, online online work, especially remote work, uh, presented quite an opportunity in the in the early days of the pandemic, where we are thinking about lockdowns, about social distancing, and and also a high number of layoffs. So it's really that combination of factors that made remote work, which you can do from your the safety of your home, presumably. Um, presented quite a lot of opportunities uh, to, to uh, really engage in income, income generation, uh, uh, especially as people had been, had been laid off so much. Um, and so the work that we're talking about here is work that can be done fully remotely or fully online. So not Uber driving, but uh, tasks like micro tasks or micro work that you do, uh, that people do on Amazon Mechanical Turk, such as tagging photos or design work that you can do on Upwork. Um, and so with this type of work, we wondered, okay, did these, uh, did the popularity of this, of this work indeed increase? And if so, who, who took advantage of these opportunities and who did, who did not. So we found that the percentage of individuals um, that had performed such work uh, did substantially increase uh, over, the, over the first few weeks of the pandemic. So um, from right before the pandemic, 21% uh, went to 38% uh, at, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So I think this, was, this survey was from uh, May, 20, uh, 2020. Um, 
And so similarly, the percentage of people who consider this work a main source of income increased from 19 to 31%. However, when we compare the individuals who have performed this work and the individuals who've not done this work, we find that gig workers are more likely to be um, to be young, to be younger, uh, to be male, and to have higher levels of digital skills. And so this suggests that, yes, these platforms did present uh, employment opportunities in the context of the pandemic, but no, these, uh, these opportunities weren't available to our, everyone or not everyone benefited from these uh, platforms um, in the same way. And so it suggests that the gig economy broadens opportunities for those already in advantaged positions rather than opening up such opportunities uh, to people who might need them most or who might have less opportunities uh, already in other ways. Um, and so it really compounds like existing, existing inequalities. Okay, so in, in the study that I just talked about, we, um, we thought about participation in either people are participating or not participating. And um, as our discussion uh, over the last hour um, has really indicated is that participation looks more complicated than that. And so one way to examine that more deeply is um, by breaking down the uh, steps or stages uh, of participation. So what, what are the stages that come before someone can actually fully participate in, an, in a community or on a platform? And, um, and breaking participation down in that way helps us understand the barriers that people might face on their way to, uh, to becoming uh, full uh, members of a community. Um, so in a study uh, that we did that Aaron led, we broke down online participation into multiple stages. And so the stages that we, um, that we modeled here was having heard of the platform, then having visited a platform, having made an account, and then finally actually performing a job um, on, uh, on the platforms that we looked at. And so obviously there's other steps here, uh, some of which are, are before the pipeline as, uh, as outlined here uh, around, around excess. And, uh, and, and so there's a lot more and a lot more steps and stages that you, that you might think about. Uh, but this gives us like a starting point to, uh, to think about the, the places where people might um, face barriers and sort of drop out of this, of this pipeline. Okay, so we examined participation uh, on Amazon Mechanical Turk and TaskRabbit. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk facilitates what we call micro tasks, and TaskRabbit uh, mostly facilitates in person chores and errands. Um, okay, so um, broadly speaking, what we find is that individuals who do this work are more likely to be younger, more educated, and uh, more digitally skilled than those who do not. Um, and so these graphs on the slide present the most important results here. They show predicted probabilities over the four pipeline stages that, uh, stages that we examined. Uh, so at the top, you see these pipeline stages, and then every dot indicates the prediction of a combination of variables. So where the color represents observed values of education and the shapes, so either squares or rectangles, indicate the interquartile range of um, internet use skills. And so we find that uh, higher education and internet skills lead to a higher predicted probability of completing, completing each of these steps of becoming a gig worker uh, on, uh, on either of these sites. Okay, so to answer my earlier question, who participates in a gig economy based on these, uh, based on these two studies, um, we find that individuals who have used these sites tend to be younger, more educated, and more digitally savvy. Uh, and so it's this last finding that I'm going to zoom in on a little bit more. Um, so we, mo we know that people with higher digital skills are more likely to perform gig work, but what does that, what does that mean exactly? Um, and so for context here, I'm uh, mostly drawing on interviews that I have been doing for the last couple of months uh, with online freelancers who use or have used um, Fiverr or Upwork to find work. 
And so the um, some of the findings that I'm uh, presenting here are very preliminary. So bear with me. I'm excited to talk about this for the very first time. Um, these these uh, so Pfeiffer and Upwork both facilitate work that fully remote, and that requires a um, substantial technical level of technical skill. Um, so you might be thinking about logo design or website design, animation, writing, copy editing, project management, uh, or anything like that. And so firstly, to define digital skills here, um, digital skills refer to the ability to navigate digital environments in order to achieve one's goals. And so any in interviews actually found that um, gig workers come to uh, come to Upwork and Pfeiffer for all kinds of reasons. And, and so what navigating the space efficiently and effectively looks like differs a lot by, uh, by, by their goals of why, why they are there. Um, so to name some examples of what this actually might look like, um, an example of a lower order skill that came up in the interviews quite a lot is knowing how to save your uh, searches. So Upwork allows you to save search strings and the freelancers I spoke to indicated that they use this feature a lot to speed up and sort of simplify the process of searching for employment and opportunities on the site. There are some people who didn't use this feature who, uh, who indicated that they sort of went through the, their searches and their search process every single time again. Uh, and especially when people do this a lot, that can really like slow them down as compared to people who, who do, um, who use uh, features like these. And an example of a more higher order skill is for example, knowing about the existing uh, existence of algorithms and sort of understanding the role that uh, algorithms might play in organizing the information on uh, on the site, and I will return to this example in in a minute. Um, but first, I want to back up and talk a little bit about a prerequisite to the ability to operate a platform in a certain way, which is having an awareness of what is actually possible in certain spaces. Um, so I find that individuals often know how to operate the platform, but are unaware of, uh, of their options in operating the platform. Uh, so for example, uh, many freelancers described um, feeling very comfortable with a platform, but then described, for example, a desire to see the platform from the client side instead of from the um, from the freelancer side. And they wanted to know what the client side was like so that they could um, see what their own profile looked like or what their profile looked like in combination or in contrast to uh, to other profiles. Um, however, then very few individuals were able to actually tell me how to do that or whether that was possible at all. And a lot of them had sort of accepted that this was just not possible. Um, so for example, here, um, talk to a freelancer who actually had been searching, who had been on, on Upwork for uh, a month and had been searching every single day for, uh, for work and had not found any uh, any work, um, so that was quite quite an ex extreme example, and or I don't know how extreme it was, but it, she was definitely very very frustrated, um, and she indicated uh, that she had no idea what other profiles looked like, and that she wished that wished that she could see that, um, so that she could get an idea of what uh, profiles looked like of people who had done a lot of work and and seemed more successful than than she was. Um, Similarly, um, here is a quote by a freelancer who was a part-time college lecturer and did um, writing and copy editing on the side. And she talked about having, um, having clients who left their contracts with her open-ended. And, um, and she wasn't sure what that looked like from the, uh, from the side of the client. So she was wondering, uh, can future clients see that I have seven contracts still open? Am I even going to be available to them? She had a lot of questions about what um, what her her profile might look like. And then also she was wondering, how does that look in comparison to, to other freelancers? Um, how did she stack up to, to them? What is the norm? 
And so actually after talking to a bunch of, of freelancers, I found out that there is a way to actually pretty easily uh, switch between the client side and the uh, freelancer side of, of Upwork. Um, and it was simply a small toggle at the top of, of every Upwork screen um, that, um, that I think from the people I've talked to, many, many people did not know about. And so it really restricted them in, uh, in sort of coming up with better strategies of how to improve their chances on, on the site. Okay, and then lastly, I wanna talk about um, how big, building digital skills happens through ongoing nonlinear and distinct pathways. And so I think that we often envision learning in a somewhat linear sense in the way that um, we, we learn and then sort of like build on the knowledge that we have acquired. And it seems that in the realm of digital skills that might actually look quite different. Um, so rather than adopting a platform or entering a community and then learning to navigate that space all in once, uh, people seem to learn in ongoing and different ways. So, and that need for learning continuously is really heightened by the changes uh, in the platform and in the gig economy changes in the market. Um, so um, the freelancer I talked to, some of the most successful ones, they seem to really adopt this um, adaptability mindset in which they were constantly respond, uh, responding to, uh, to changes in the market, to changes in the platform, try to constantly study and sort of observe what's going on and how they can, um, how they can become better and faster at navigating the space. Um, so especially more successful and more invested freelancers seem to invest a lot of time into this um, and, and really uh, ex, ex, did a lot of exploration. It looked a lot like, um, like a trial and error process in which they would try something and then would see how it would uh, change their, their outcomes. Um, so an example of this is this somewhat long quote um, by uh, a freelancer who was a software engineer and college student. And they talked about actually having set up a second account in, in which they take the client uh, perspective. So they set up a client account on the, uh, um, on the, on the uh, freelancing platform, which is quite an innovative way to get around this, this problem that I presented earlier, where people didn't know about, uh, about the client perspective on the site. And so they got another computer, another device, and sort of searched for uh, services to see whether they would come up and uh, and and where in the in the pages. Um, and when they didn't see themselves, they would try and change something in the wording of their gigs or in their profile to uh, to see if that would change their their outcomes in in these search algorithms. Um, and so that really relies on certain skills and knowledge around. Uh, around algorithms, how they work, and um, and that's that's not something that I saw in in all the interviews. And actually, I think this stands really in contrast with uh, with other workers uh, who didn't engage in this type of exploration, not in this type of like uh, trial and error exploration. And um, I can think of a bunch of reasons for that. It seems like time and energy are big reasons for that, but also just urgency. Uh, in uh, an urgency, level of urgency that someone feels in generating, generating an income from these platforms. Um, but then also a, uh, the mindset with which they came to these sites and, and that explorative mindset tended to be uh, stronger in some people than in others. Um, well, regardless of the reasons, um, people appear to learn and build digital skills in very distinct ways. And it is such pathways that I think we need to understand and need to think about uh, to, to really understand and increase participation on platforms and, and in communities. And so that brings me to some implications that we, what we might talk about. Um, so first, and I think this, this has gone through widely in, uh, in my presentation and uh, Hernan's, uh, opportunities on the internet or mediated by the internet are not equally available to all, right? So um, it's useful, I think, to think about who is present in a space and who is not, um, and what might be barriers that someone is facing that is not present in my space uh, or in a specific platform or community uh, already. 
And so digital skills, I believe, are an important barrier to online participation and especially uh, skills related to knowing what is what is possible, having an awareness of what's possible uh, on in a certain digital environment. And so lastly, uh, my research shows that building these skills uh, is ongoing, nonlinear and different for different people. And so um, I think allowing for that experimentation and providing people with feedback. So maybe having people, allowing people to have multiple accounts or um, to, uh, to give them space to really do that type of exploring, um, I think is really useful. And at the same time, I think we need to think about ways that people can share their knowledge and their skills, um, and especially how more invested users can share their knowledge and skills with less invested or like less skilled users. Um, great. And with that, I'd like to thank you and also acknowledge my co-authors and advisors in this work, Aaron and Esther.